Coming to you live from our houses in Los Angeles, California, it's Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone, your comedy field guide to life. Tonight, Pyeongchang, South Korea, the 2018 Winter Olympics. It's the final seconds of the women's cross-country ski team sprint freestyle race. Jessie Diggins trails two of the best sprinters in the world. She digs deep. She can help America win its first cross-country skiing gold medal. Did she push beyond the bounds of her endurance? Or did she pull out her cell phone and send a text? We'll find out because Jessie Diggins is our guest tonight. And she's on her phone. Plus, Thomas Coyne updates. Where has he not been? Tony Anita Hull has the breaking non-news. I'm Adam Felber, the man who tries to keep this show cutting through the conversational snow and headed for the topical finish line. And now, please welcome the woman who wanders off the conversational race course and goes cross-country, as in another country altogether, Paula Poundstone! Hey, hey, you guys! Thank you so welcome, much. Paula. Hey, 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 you guys, and thanks to tonight's house band, Travis Vance, He's been touring with country superstar Thomas Rhett for many years, and we are lucky enough to have him. Thank you so much. Sounds fantastic, Travis. Yeah. Welcome aboard. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'll be honest. I kind of do miss the ducks a little bit. Um, but well, That's uh, right. You had ducks last week. Uh, the uh, pod puppy, Mo, I guess, placed them there as a prank. She did. She's been doing these pranks. This morning, I woke up with honey on my toes. Uh, which means that she's also been watching my uh, videotape of uh, the original Parent Trap from Walt Disney, because that was a prank that was done in there. And well, what uh, kind of prank is honey on the toes? Well, in the movie, it was they were camping and the twins pranked their potential new stepmom. Um, they put honey on her toes to try to get a bear to come in. Um, oh. So I'm, I'm guessing Mo might have watched the movie, but didn't really get the concept that you have to be camping in order for that prank to really work. Well, <laughs> she's a dog, Adam. That's a lot to expect of a dog. You know what? You know, usually I don't have all... Mostly I work and I take care of my animals and I work and I take care of my animals. But I have to say, this week, I had a little change up in my course of events. Um, I got a small part in an animated series and they were doing what's called a table read which as you know under normal circumstances this would be with the cast around a table um a, but a table a, yeah yeah a table but of course now we're forced to do it via zoom uh so they sent me an animated background which they sent every actor with their character on it mine is a sex driven older turtle um but my computer <laughs> won't do backgrounds so I get on the Zoom call, and I was already really f pissed by some tech problems that I was having. Now, this is the first episode that my character is in. I'm not in all of them. So the cast had already worked together before without me. Um, but when the cast gets on the call, I was already embroiled in a conversation with the director about how confusing trying to print the script was. And then they told me that I could leave the script on the computer and read it from there, which is great. But I was the only actor with with no background, right? So I just had like shitty lighting and, uh, you know, and they could see like my bedroom and all the activity going on. So we get started with the reading and my dogs start making noise right away. So I have to carry the computer <laughs> with me to put them in the backyard. Then I hear them in the house again and I realize I didn't shut the back door so I have to carry the computer and, and put them out again. And there's, you know, ruff, 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 while they're trying to do the table read. So, so then I realized I can mute myself, right? Which I hadn't even thought about before. So I push the mute button. And now I have the script right there on the computer before me. And I'm reading along and listening while this really terrific cast, by the way, um, uh, reads this script and it's getting closer and closer to my line. And, you know, when you have a very small part and you sit through all the other lines, you know, the pressure that your handful of lines take on becomes very great. So uh, it's getting closer yeah. and closer to my line. And I accidentally click on something that made the script 
move underneath the Zoom logo. So I can't see the script. Now, I know I, I'm supposed to say, sure is, in an older kind of <laughs> sexy voice. And I don't know exactly when, So, I, I, but I can't figure out how to get the script back on top of the Zoom page. Finally, I click on something and there it is. So I'm all set. My turtle love interest says something like, it's a nice night for turtle sex. And I say, sure is. And I did it like not too old and not too blatantly randy, you know, not gross. It was like layered. There was backstory to it. I I mean, I nailed it. And then I hear the director say, Paula, you're muted. Now the Zoom page... (laughs) is covering the script again. And I finally get myself unmuted, but I can't find the script. I'm so frustrated. And by this time, I'm so nervous and full of anxiety. And when that happens, I have no memory. So the guy says, my love interest says, you know, it's a nice night for turtle sex. And I just blurt out, I wouldn't fuck you if you were the last turtle on earth. So. Wow. You did not. I I did. Is that true? Yes. So I, I'm pretty sure I lost that job. <laughs> it's good though. It gives me more time to do. Nobody listens to Paula Pound. So it's good. I, I didn't need that job. Wow. Well, you, it sounds like you panicked. Yeah. I did. That's exactly what happened. I, I panicked, and uh, you know, oh my gosh. So now I'm just accepting that I'm probably, you know, not going to be a sex-driven older turtle. I, I try to come to grips with that about myself almost every day. <laughs> oh, you are. You are going to be a sex-driven older turtle, Adam. You I, are. I used to believe. I just don't believe it anymore, Paula. <laughs> oh, well. But I hope you keep the job because, you know, it's the ongoing plots on this show that really keep the show going. The search for Thomas Coyne, the tragic but necessary hunt for the murderer of poor Doug the intern. These kind of ongoing plots is really what, you know, keeps listeners coming back and keeps building our audience. Oh, I'm sure of it. Yeah. I mean, I barely pass a person on the street that doesn't say, aren't you Paula Poundstone from Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. So... The you keep walking up the is, same street, though, though. Is, is growing and growing. Uh, well, speaking of ongoing stories, aren't we yes. going to say hi to, to Bonnie and Tony? That's what we're doing. Um, we're going to go around the horn and say hello to... Let's start this week in Studio City or Sherman Oaks. I always forget which. But with uh, my neighbor, our producer, Tony Anita Hull. How the heck are you, Tony? Hey, guys. It's Sherman Oaks. Shokes. Hi, over here. Tony. Hi. Um... The original Parent Trap is one of my favorite movies, just to put it out there. Oh, um, let's get together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a yeah, great yeah, movie. Yeah. That's why. And I like it's when, a great movie. It's a great movie, and I like when Vicky slaps one of them, and she goes, you give your sister her half of this. Oh, I don't remember well, that's, that. That's very good. That's very good. Uh, Tony, that's not what you <laughs> anyway. had to share, though, is it? No. <laughs> no. Okay. I just got really excited about The Parent Trap. Anyway, um, I took care of a one-and-a-half-year-old for a couple days, and I don't know if you guys know this, but kids are a lot of work. As yeah. it turns I was, out. I was very, very tired afterwards. But it was a lot of fun. She is a year and a half. Her name's Kira, and her baby brother was born. And while her parents were at the hospital, I was in charge of her. Wow. And how did you end up with that job? I volunteered. I think it okay. sounds like a great job. It's a fun It does age. sound like a great job. I just don't know where one finds, you know, if, if you're a parent giving birth to a second child, where one finds a Tony Anita Hull to take care of Kira. Well, they're, they're some of my very best friends. So. Oh, okay. Tony, Tony knows yeah. so many people. She knows lots and lots and lots of young couples. She went to college with most young couples. She did. Most young couples. And then she met all the other young couples on a cruise. Well, I'll tell you, to the degree that um, when Biden's people were trying to figure out, you know, how to go about getting their message out um, in order to reach the young couple, you know, category, uh, they just went straight to Tony Anita Hall. (laughs) <laughs> and they said, can you tell your friends uh, to vote for uh, Biden-Harris? Biden-Harris, and, and yeah. And Tony's been sowing the seed. 
Now, t- Tony, what was the most challenging part of taking care of little Kira? Uh, whenever she's awake, you just have to watch her. Yeah. <laughs> like you can't. She climbs yeah. things. Um, she puts things in her mouth. She likes to try to eat rocks. I wow. did hit her head on the changing table, too. <laughs> well, the first time I went to change, I just I just laid her down and smacked hit her head on the changing table but um, it's okay it's no really that was stressful. her fault she should have known it that was. table was there i mean how many times has she been changed already yeah no that was on her um you know what i just think that the parents who you kindly did this for should be so pleased to hear you say that you have to watch the child <laughs> i agree yeah yeah, you're right. But, At that age, you just right. You just can't take your eyes off them because they're always doing something. They're doing it just non-stop. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bonnie Burns up in the Simi Valley. How you doing? I'm doing well. Um, just hearing you guys talk has given me so many ideas of what to talk about. Um, because I was going to you're say You're supposed thank to get you. the ideas from your life. You're not supposed yeah, to no. say. So what were you going to say? Like, were you I gonna was borrow... going to say I've gotten so many emails from people just saying they like Captain Quinkle, being so nice to Captain Quinkle. And I just wanted to acknowledge that I appreciate the support. That's what I was going to say. That's oh, great. That's, that's nice. a good thing to say. Right. Yeah. But hearing you guys talk Uh-oh. just gave me so many ideas <laughs> of stuff to say. One was to tell Tony if she had mentioned to Paula and I that you were taking care of a toddler, we would have said, that's really exhausting. But the other thing, this story I wanted to tell, which is, um, you know, I've done some things that seem pretty hard in my career. And uh, so when I was going to go get my, my daughter was about to be born, a friend of mine said, you know, you seem so relaxed. And I was talking about how I'd known these people that they had a baby and like, They kept complaining about how exhausted they were and how hard it was. And I thought, what's a big deal? I've done so many hard things at my job. I don't even think it's going to affect me. I sent a guy off the rim of the Grand Canyon because I used to work with stuntmen. So anyway, my daughter gets born. And the thing I came to realize was all that time I was working so hard and I went nights without sleep, that was all on my decision. Once I had a kid, it wasn't my decision. That's absolutely true. Yeah. That's absolutely true. You spend those first two years exhausted. Exhausted. And my sister-in-law called me about three or four days after Ivy is born, and she said, do you want me to come down and help you? And I'm like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me just say something, and I think it's important. You know, your your job doesn't necessarily translate into raising children, so... Um, and Tony, keep this in mind, should you babysit again, you cannot send a toddler off the edge of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely that is true. Really frowned That's an upon. automatic call from child services. Yeah, yeah. Don't, just don't do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No reason to, really. Uh, you know, a, a time out, I think, is more than enough. <laughs> you don't want me sending you off the Grand Canyon again, do you? You know what the response is to that? No! <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have one thing to share, which is something interesting that happened this week. My daughter finally relented. You know, I'd been growing my hair out for, for her over these COVID times, and she finally looked at me and she said, you know what, Dad, you can shave your head if you want. Boy, See, as Bonnie was saying, that before you did things um, because you chose to do it, and after you have kids, you do things because they choose it. I wouldn't go as far as to have my kid tell me what to do with my hair. But Well, COVID times are weird times, Paula. There's there's really no reason for me not to let my daughter see what I looked like with hair. Because yeah. you know, what else am I doing with my time? I, I don't have to be yeah. seen anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's true. Um, after three months of growing out my hair, and it, it was getting pretty, it was getting pretty shaggy. It was nearly two inches long. Um, Woo! Uh, sh- I, I shaved it yesterday. So you you spent this time growing your hair? Yep, I did. 
<laughs> That's what I did I, with my COVID time. I, I mean, I was able to do other time. things. Growing hair is no, not like taking no, care of a toddler. No, you must have been exhausted. <laughs> you would probably go to bed at night. You would leave dishes in the sink and say to your wife, I, I just can't. I've been growing my hair all day. I, I have to. <laughs> and I'm exhausted, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to go to bed. Okay, uh, wait. Yeah. I have to admit something. Oh, boy. Okay, so Adam. <sighs> Uh oh. Yes. You know, Adam has this new. He has a new baseball podcast. I do. And I tuned into it because I was very excited for you, and I wanted to listen to it and see it. So I went to Starburns where the podcast is. I clicked uh-huh. on the link, and I'm like, "Where the fuck is Adam?" What? And I keep waiting for Adam. And finally, I start like you know, fast forwarding through. <laughs> I get to the end of the show, and I'm like. What the hell? He couldn't have had the wrong link. Adam wouldn't do that. And I go back and I start looking and here's this guy who's got like a beard and mustachey thing. And he's got this really long hair and kind of bald on the top. And I realize that it's you. Yeah. Um. I, all right. This activates a couple of things here, Bonnie. Number <laughs> n- number one. Uh, um. You I'm you glad you, you did it. you did hear the podcast, right? No. Well, I heard some of it, but I'm not really a baseball fan. So you didn't. You tuned in, but you I didn't, didn't know listen. It was you. But you turned. I didn't know it was you. <laughs> you went to a podcast and you didn't listen. I didn't know it was him. Okay, and here's the other half. Thank you, Paula. Here's the other half. You're aware (laughs) that my podcast is not so much a podcast as it is a simulcast. So if you were fast-forwarding through it, there was no way you were watching the baseball along with it. I don't care about baseball. I was doing it to see you. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. I was supporting you. That's that's very supportive. Anyway, you really did have long hair. I didn't even recognize you. This is why... This is why witness accounts of crimes are not always that reliable. <laughs> okay, here's the other thing I shouldn't yeah. say. Uh-oh. But Paula said things she shouldn't say. <laughs> I always say I called Tony. I just happened to be talking to her last night. Mm-hmm. She went and looked, and she didn't recognize you either. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I... I just had some hair on my head. That's all. I, I didn't. Boy. I wasn't. I'm not a master of disguise. I, I grew out my hair for a couple of months. Boy, that that Bonnie can keep a secret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Paula. Yeah. Woo. I need to. I need to pull the lever for the escape valve labeled vocabulary song. To get out oh of my gosh! <laughs> I, you know what? I was so into all these stories of not recognizing Adam that I almost <laughs> forgot entirely. I have a word this week. Um, okay. The word is phlegmatic. Uh, it's an adjective that means calm and unemotional. Here, I'll use it in a sentence. I'm worried that I'm developing a phlegmatic response to the quotidian outrages of 2020. Now, I'll tell you, I really want to remember this word. So naturally, Adam, I'm putting it into my vocabulary song. Uh, Here we go. This week's word is phlegmatic. It's an adjective that means unemotional and calm. Oh, look, I just drove a nail through my palm. Last week's (laughs) word was quotidian. It's an adjective that means happening every day daily or ordinary, like a maner eating a blueberry. The week before that, we had gaucherie. It's a noun that means awkward or unsophisticated ways. I haven't used a napkin in days. Going back before that, we had disputatious. It's an adjective that means fond of or causing heated arguments. Fuck you, I don't want your two cents. And not long ago, we had inveigle. It's a verb that means persuade someone to do something by deception or flattery. I love you, mom. Um, will you buy me a new phone battery? Let's never forget Gallimaufry, which I pronounced wrong until nobody James Hyder corrected me. It's a noun that means confused jumbler medley of things. Hodgepodge, who's podge, who's podge, hodgepodge. Adam doesn't think my song is replicable, 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 but I do, I do. Woo! Oh. 
Bravo. Wow. <laughs> I noticed you um you uh omitted one of the I do's this week. I do. All right. You didn't. <laughs> <then. laughs> I didn't. Um, you know what? The whole time Tony was taking care of that toddler, I was practicing on my glockenspiel with my vocabulary song, so I am wiped out. <laughs> Parents, you might feel like your kid's summer vacation started way early if you've been at home together, and it's never going to end. Well, learning at home doesn't have to stop for summer, and in fact, here's a really fun way to learn at home. Because this company, KiwiCo, delivers basically a science fair or an art class right to your door. I was surprised how much I enjoyed doing it, even as an adult, as my uh, seven-year-old daughter and I built a walking robot. Now, that robot... Um, that robot turned evil. Am I correct about that? Yes, but I can't blame that on KiwiCo. Yeah. It was, um, it was Vivian's idea to add a laser and my idea to add a personality chip, which apparently, uh, I guess I must have dented or something. It it became a psychotic evil robot and, um, yeah, that can happen. But that's not going to happen to the average consumer, I don't think. I think this is such. A great idea because, you know, over the summer, um, my, you know, my kids are all young adults now, but over the summer, I used to just make them read these big, thick books about engineering. And when they were done with that, um, I would say, you know, finish that because they would grouse about it, you know, when I would say, finish that and I'll let you yeah. read the dictionary. And so this, yeah, I just it, think, sounds but, so much happier. Yeah, because what y- Absolutely, because what you were doing is what social scientists have defined as not fun, whereas the KiwiCo stuff is really fun. Yeah, and I never should have let my son have that staple gun. No, no, you shouldn't have. Yeah, a three-year-old and a staple gun do not go together. They do not. So do your part to encourage your children to be innovators and creative thinkers. They won't believe what they can build and accomplish with KiwiCo. And when they're finished, watch their confidence be as big as their smile. We never got that from the big engineering books. No, the engineering book's done, but but the walking robot, I got that. As a parent, it can be really hard to find creative and new things to keep your children busy and challenged. KiwiCo does the legwork for you so you can spend quality time tackling projects together at home. There are different crates for kids of all ages— and there's, so there's something for every kid on your list, including you. There's no commitment. You can pause or cancel any time. By the way, don't misunderstand that idea that there's a different crate uh, for every kid. It's a crate that the KiwiCo product is inside of. We are not shipping kids. Yeah, that's so important to be clear about. KiwiCo is redefining play with hands-on projects that build confidence, creativity, and critical thinking skills. There's something for every kid or kid at heart. At KiwiCo, get 30% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line at KiwiCo.com slash Paula. That's K-I-W-I-C-O dot com slash Paula. If you were going to do it anyways, go ahead and use our offer. We get a little credit and you get 30% off. Me and Tony aren't the only ones working hard. Lots of you guys submitted answers for our vocabulary word contest. If you missed it, on show number 109, we launched our vocabulary contest where you could win a Zoom call with me and Adam and up to 100 of your friends if you were the first one to find the vocabulary words in that episode 109. We thought we'd have a winner right away, but we don't. So keep those answers coming, but search carefully, my friends, because you can only submit one answer. Adam and I are anxious to meet you and your friends and to try out our social skills. Coming up, Stephen Wright said, cross-country skiing is great if you live in a small country. Well, Jessie Diggins lives in the big old U.S. of A. and won us a gold medal. She's here to talk about the challenge of cross-country skiing. That's coming up when we return on Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. On this day in unremarkable history, Henry VIII said, Love has made a fool of me before, you know. (laughs) (laughs) 
Thank you, house band Travis Vance. Uh, Paula, I remember uh, some years ago, and wait, wait, don't tell me, you made a casual comment that stirred up some dust. Yeah, now, okay, I'll have to ask our guest to help me remember what prompted me to say this. I think I must have been in a hotel room and seen some qualifying event for the Olympics. But uh, so I... I was on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and somehow the subject of cross-country skiing came up. I've forgotten why. But um, mm-hmm. I said that I had seen this event, and I said, the, the Americans don't have a chance. I said, it's all the, all the Nordic women are up front because they grew up doing that. That's how they used to go get their bread from the store. And I said, you know, the Americans, you never even see them. They're way behind. They're they're back there. As the others are coming over the finish line, the Americans are way off somewhere texting one another. I think (laughs) that's what I said. I think that's what you said exactly. Now that, that didn't go unheard, right? It it unleashed some fury. Uh, So a lot of people were were mad at me because I had said that. And then um, I can't remember and our guest will have to tell me how this came to be. But I remember uh, somehow I got sent a, a, a very funny video of the United States women's cross country ski team training uh, and, you know, using like workout equipment and stuff. And they were all walking around and doing sit ups and stuff, all staring at their flat things, all with their iPhones in their hands, as if texting. that is indeed <laughs> right. Texting them is very funny. Uh, so, and, and then, uh, yeah. I had to, uh, well, I had, I had a large bowl of my word soup soon thereafter, uh, a fresh, uh, piping hot dish of my own words because, uh, they, uh, the U S women's cross country ski team kicked ass at the subsequent Olympics and brought home the gold. And it was a fantastic finish to that gold medal race. So what we're going to do is let's listen to the very end, the play-by-play. This is really exciting. As they come into the stadium, Diggins trying to get in on the outside. Jesse Diggins with two fifth-place finishes, one sixth. So close for the U.S. on so many occasions. Now moving up on the inside into second place. They're all completely gassed. They've given it everything on the global bucket. It's Steven Nielsen leading Jesse Diggins into the final turn. Can Diggins answer? As the roars rattle around the cross-country stadium in Pyeongchang, Sweden, the U.S. and Norway come into the line. Here comes Diggins! Here comes Diggins! Diggins making the play around Sweden. (laughs) Jesse Diggins to the line. <laughs> that will be in the US. Wow, what a call. Now, we have that gold medal winner on the phone with us right now. Jesse Diggins was named to the United States ski team in 2012. And in 2018, she and teammate Kicken Randall won the United States' first ever cross-country skiing gold medal at the Winter Olympics. She was chosen as the flag bearer for America in the closing ceremony. Please welcome Jesse Diggins. Yay! <laughs> Yes. <laughs> hey guys, it's now, so hold, hold on one sec. I gotta just put down my phone. I was sending a quick text. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jesse, you, the, let's talk about the event that you won. You won the the sprint, right? It's two two skiers around the track. Yeah, the team sprint. So, um, with my longtime teammate and very good friend, Keegan Randall, she was leg one. And I was leg two, the anchor leg, um, and it was a team sprint. So um, it's two skiers around a 1.6-kilometer track, and each skier completes three laps for a total of six laps per team, and you're tagging off to each other in between every run. So you, you know, race your heart out for about two and a half minutes, and then you only have um, two and a half minutes while your partner – is racing the lap oh. to recover. So it's kind of like um, who can long distance sprint the best. It'd be like if you had to run a hundred meters and then wait and then do it again and then wait and do it again. Oh my gosh. 
Now, you know, Jesse, forgive me, but I'm not sure I really understand cross-country skiing. When I was a kid, we used to go <laughs> sledding on a hill, and the ride down the hill was exhilarating, but pulling the sled back up the hill sucked. And to me, <laughs> cross-country skiing looks like it's all pulling the sled back up the hill. Uh, and it can't be. That can't be it, or you guys wouldn't still be doing it. So my question to you is, what am I missing? Okay. <laughs> That's fair. That's a very fair question. <laughs> um, so imagine you're sledding, but yeah. you might have a different sled than someone else, and you're not sure if your sled is faster than their sled. And someone else, um, you have a team of people that have – you know, put special stuff in the bottom of your sled to make it faster. So right off the bat, there's a competitive element to it. Secondly, uh -huh. you are, you do get to race down the hill with your sleds as well as run up the hill with your sleds. Thirdly, imagine you're allowed to crash into other people. Not on purpose, but it might happen. <laughs> There's an element of danger and excitement in there because cross-country skiing, unlike track and field or swimming, there is no lanes. I mean, people are oh. cutting in front of one another, um, passing each other. Sometimes you get blocked from passing someone. So in any sort of mass start event, it's like go-kart sledding on on crazy <laughs> fast sleds where you also run up the hill. Um, that's the best analogy I can give you. But I oh, think it's making all, making all the sense in the world to me now. So, oh, Jesse, yeah. when did when did you start? How did you? I mean, I never even heard of cross country skiing until probably I was in high school. So, how, when did you start? Um, I started really young because my parents loved cross country skiing, and they really just loved everything outside. We would always be um, canoeing and camping and hiking in the summer and. In the winter, we might go um, ice skating on the lake, but we would also go cross-country skiing because it's a really cool way to see a lot of nature because you're moving so much faster than if you're snowshoeing. Um, so we would go yeah. as a family, and we joined the Minnesota Youth Ski League. But what's really going to kill you here is that what really attracted me to the sport was actually the sledding that I would do afterwards. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't in it for the cross country skiing at first. I was in it for the hot chocolate and the sledding parties. Um, but then oh, slowly, well, it kind of it snuck up on me. And what do you think it was about it that snuck up on you? Is it what you were talking about before this competitive feeling, which you don't have with hot chocolate? <laughs> I mean, since <laughs> I drink your hot chocolate. Um, but I, I think what really. I think what really um, attracted me to the sport was the competitive aspect because once I started racing with my high school team, I was like, oh, man, like you can score points for your team. You can train with your teammates and then, you know, you push your body super hard. And I know this sounds crazy and all sorts of messed up, but I love the feeling of challenging my body, pushing it hard, seeing how fast can I get up this hill? How fast can I go down this hill? You know, how tight can I take this corner but without crashing? Like, I just, I see it as almost this real-life video game when I'm going around the course, and, and I'm playing for keeps, and it's so fun. I, and it just, the more I trained, the faster I raced, and, of course, that's really fun. Um, right. And the faster I raced, the more I got to try to race with the boys and beat them, and that's really fun. So, you know, it yeah. just kind of snowballed. <laughs> So and now that I have you here in my clutches, uh, I, I, I have to ask you this. Um, just what's it like to be an Olympian? Do, do you really feel like you're representing your country? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's so many myths that go around about the Olympics. Like, no, uh -huh. the athletes are not all having sex with one another. At least, you know, that well, I know I never of. heard that myth. <laughs> oh, I man. always heard that myth. Really? Oh, you totally did. Oh, Absolutely. that's a horrible yeah. idea. Wouldn't that <laughs> screw up your training? And couldn't you end up having a baby that's part cross-country skier and and part swimmer? That's not safe. <laughs> it would be so confusing. That's an incomplete understanding of genetics, I think there, Paula. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't like the sounds of this. Not to mention Summer and Winter Olympics. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe there were some summer Olympians just hanging around because all their life they dreamed of fucking a winter Olympian. That could be. 
It's possible, <laughs> Paula, but I don't. I don't think that's the line of questioning we're going for here. No. Okay. All right. So, so do you have a feeling? So, and what are the other rumors, by the way? Oh man. Well, it depends on which Olympics you went to, but I think people think that you're just going to run around and like sightsee. But like when we went to South Korea, I feel like I never got to see the country at all. I saw the inside of the Olympic Village, and that was that was it. Because I was racing either every other day or every third day because I did every event. And so, like, I never even went down to the coastal village. Like, every athlete that was down at the coast, like, all the ice sports, I never even got to see them. It was crazy. Um, and so I think it's just kind of funny because it's, it's, it's a very, very cool time in your life. But it's also absolutely the most stressful. Um, there's so much pressure. And it's, oh, like... Yeah. Yeah, and we were on such a weird schedule because all of a sudden you go from normally racing in the morning to racing sometimes at like 6 p.m. at night. And so we became these weird night owls. Like one of my cool down jogs to kind of shake out after the race was at midnight. Just like running wow. through the Olympic Village at midnight with my teammate. And there were, there were so many people awake. It was so weird um, because everyone's schedule had shifted and they were like, trying to not get jet lag it was so strange but um to to like finally focus and answer your question um i guess i would no, say i love hearing that i mean I, I don't know that there's any sort of feeling of being an olympian like it doesn't change who you are it doesn't change your day-to-day -day. um it maybe changes the way people see you but i imagine it's a little bit like what it must feel like to be a comedian it probably doesn't change how you live but people maybe see you differently and they expect something of you because they know who you are oh so like you're That's at a party and somebody will be like come on just ski a few miles for me <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i haven't gone to any of those kind of parties but um <laughs> that, that that is what they say to you when you're a comic a lot of times people would say oh could you tell us a joke yes absolutely uh, but, yeah so um so what about connecting you know, you know, the world is so screwed up, obviously, right now. And I and I do think like, well, music and sports are two of the ways where we seem as human beings to connect with one another and other countries in like great ways where people understand each other. Do you think that happens in the Olympics? I do. I and I know this is like so cheesy and a little like woo woo but um I have so many friends from around the world um and I think sport does break it down um and like you said music you know it breaks it down to just the fundamentals of like perseverance grit you're trying hard you're putting it all on the line and you, you gotta respect that you know like whether you win or lose you see people putting their heart and soul into it and there's just this fundamental level of respect and and sports womanship out there that I feel like I've made so many good friends where like when they win, I'm genuinely pumped for them because I knew what it what it took for them to get there mm -hmm. and and vice versa right. too, you know. And um, so I do think it's pretty cool and it's a really cool chance to see that we're not as different as humans as sometimes we think we are. You know, like they get to see that not all Americans are rude and, and suck. And, and we get to see that, you know, we're not totally as different from the rest of the world as sometimes things are made out to be. Um, and I think it's a really cool chance to see that just on a human level, we're, we're all pretty similar. We all have similar wants and, and needs and goals. So yeah. your friends from around the world were pretty happy for you to, to see you taking home the first American gold in cross country. Was there a, a real awareness of that in the village? Oh, yeah. It was really cool. I mean, the first thing, like when I got up off the snow, Keegan and I were both hugged by every single team out there. Like, and, wow. and by, 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 by women who, by all means, were more qualified than us to win that medal were favorites. <laughs> um, no. no, for real. Like, I had no business going toe to toe with those two girls in that final hundred meters. But, um, but they were so genuinely happy because they knew what this meant for our country and, and what it could do to grow the sport. And, and he knew it was a big deal. And, and they were pumped. It was so cool. It was just um, one of the most special oh moments God. of my life. 
That sounds so great. You know, I, I want to recommend to our, our listeners, the nobodies, that w- when I looked at um, Jesse's race last night, it came from a thing that was part of a, a collection of videos, and it was something like, you know, 10 great Olympic sports moments. Well, I have to say that, Jesse, yours was the greatest of the, of the <laughs> ones that I looked at. Pretty really dramatic. sincerely, it was. Um, oh, but man. Watching, watching all of them, I, I don't know. There was something about the time, the timing of it. Um, just like you were saying, like watching people put out this kind of effort and maybe it just felt like especially now that we're you know that the olympics is canceled or postponed or whatever it is maybe it just felt like this little slice of normalcy but it was so uplifting to watch all that so i'm recommending to uh my nobodies that um check that out because it really yeah it it lifted my spirits it's great stuff well you know it's it's really the announcer who made it great. Chad Salmola, his call of that. <laughs> Without him, it'd be like, yeah, cool, I guess. That's like, that's pretty cool. But with it, w- it his was, voice. You're right. Yeah. It was really It, it was, was a legendary really, piece of work. He, he loses he his mind. He was really yeah. great. But, you know, if I were you, Jesse, I would, that would be my ringtone. <laughs> oh, man, no. <laughs> my fiance would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> like every time someone called, you'd hear like it's Jesse Dickens. She's, she's, she's coming around the corner. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Wh- whoever was calling you, it would be a little disappointing once you answered the phone. It would be, "Hi, yeah. Jesse, it's Mom." Oh, hi. <laughs> but just you get so amped to answer the phone. You just get so pumped up. Oh, I I would. I would put it on my ringtone and then keep calling myself. Well, I tell you what, you can put it as my ringtone for my number. And if I call you, you're going to hear, here comes Diggins. Oh, that's a great idea. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, I'm going to do that. (laughs) You know, Dr. Ruth Westheimer said, talking from morning to night about sex has helped my skiing because I talk about movement, about looking good, about taking risks. Stay tuned to find out more about taking risks on and off your skis. The Cat of the Week is Rue from Portland, Oregon. Hey, Adam, a few weeks back, I became a Thrive Market member. Congratulations. Yeah, they're delivering organic and sustainable groceries right to my door. My favorite thing right now is Schmidt's Cleaning Vinegar. There's a variety of... Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I like to clean. It's very satisfying, and I like the smell of vinegar. It's so much better than, you know, the yucky-smelling cleaning products that you usually get. Uh, you, you just feel like it's better for the environment. I assume it is better for the environment, and it does a good job. Uh, so, there. That's what I love about Thrive Market. Once you try Thrive Market, you'll love it Maybe as much as I do. That's not the sort of thing I can guarantee, but maybe as much as I do. Here's why. As a proud Thrive Market member, I get the products that I love, and my paid membership provides a free one for someone in need, like a low-income family or, or, or a teacher, so they're not having to pay for their own school supplies, a veteran or a first responder, who, by the way, thank you, Thank you, first responders. Thrive Market tailors to over 70 different diets and values like paleo or keto or plant-based. I didn't even know there were 70 different diets. I didn't know. Oh, there's the Neanderthal diet, the Neanderthal, which is uh, a Cro-Magnon. diet that it increases the size of your forehead. Uh, mm-hmm. There's some the pe- Australopithecus some are, Some people are into diet. that. There's the koala diet, which is um, mostly uh, eucalyptus. Anyway, they deliver the highest quality organic and sustainable essentials from groceries, healthy snacks, meat and seafood, clean wines, non-toxic cleaning and bath and body. You know, I'm a member, Paula, and I'm saving 25 to 50 percent off traditional retail prices. And their carbon neutral shipping is free on orders over forty nine dollars. So I'm helping the planet and saving money. Wow. That's you know what? Great deal. 
Um, the savings I get on my favorite clean organic products are amazing. But I also feel good about helping to support communities in need. In addition to membership matching, Thrive Market has raised over $750,000 to date through their COVID-19 relief fund. I'm a proud Thrive Market member. You will be too. Try it risk-free. Go to thrivemarket.com slash Paula. Join today and you'll get up to $20 in shopping credit towards your first order. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash Paula, which is P-A-U-L-A, to start your risk-free membership and get up to $20 towards your first order. Thrivemarket.com slash Paula. Will you spell my first name again? I'm trying to write a check. And we're back. You know, Jesse, you know, years ago, uh, I had a television show that, you know, if you blinked, you missed it. It was not not on for long at all. But I had um, Jackie Joyner Kersey uh, train me. Me too. The premise was that I was challenging um, Carl Lewis, who was at that time the fastest man in the world. I was challenging him to a running race. And we were going to film it from like a helicopter or something. And it was going to be a 50 yard dash Um, because what you usually see is the fastest man in the world race, the second fastest man in the world. And so you really never have a sense of how much faster than the rest of us are these people. So I had this idea that I was going to race Carl Lewis and Jackie Joyner Kersey came on my show to help me train. And what was just brilliant about her is I'm not sure that she ever really thought I was, I mean, yes, I was really going to raise Carl Lewis, but I knew it was funny. Whereas <laughs> I don't, th- I don't think she has that bone in her body. <laughs> so she was showing me how to get out of the block, you know, how to start. And she said, cause that's his weak area. So if you can get a little edge on him there. <laughs> and did you did you get an edge on Carl Lewis? <laughs> I did not. Um, oh, sadly, God. it was like we challenged him and then I was training and we were going to build up to it. But the show got canceled before the big race ever no. took place, which is really too bad. But the thing about her that reminds me of you, and I don't know if it's what happens when you, you know, you sort of boil down all great athletes, but is um, standing beside her was like a physical experience. She was so positive. She was so energetic and driven um, that, you know, you you caught like a contact from her, you know, And, and I feel this sort of, you know, positivity from you as well. And maybe that's just who you have to be to be at that level of sport, or maybe you develop it as a result of the sport? What do you think? Oh, man. That's a good question because I've gotten my butt kicked enough that I have no right to be this optimistic. Um, But (laughs) (laughs) I I was actually listening to something the other day where they said, you know, optimism is something you can train like a muscle. And you need to because you have to have this belief that it's going to work out. Um, Otherwise, why bother? Right. Like if you at your core, if you don't believe that you can get where you're going to go, then why would you ever try at all? And I think um, I think a lot of athletes do share this like core optimism of like, yeah, I can do this. Like it's going to be super hard, but I can probably get this task done. Like I can I can manage this. And even if this at the time is like this small segment of training, you just see it as like this one step at a time. Um, but yeah, I think I'm also, you know, I've been described as exhausting and annoyingly peppy. So, you know, it goes both ways. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jesse, I immediately needed to take us to the to the, the great unasked question. We heard Paula's um, the best of her recollection of her history with your team. What do you remember was the sequence of events in Poundstone Gate? <laughs> Um, (laughs) so great. Um, well, we were actually, um, riding in a van from Davos, Switzerland, um, to Italy to, uh, race in the world cup. And we're all sitting in a van and all of a sudden Noah Hoffman, one of my teammates, he loves listening to wait, wait, don't tell me. Um, many of us Uh do. 
and he was listening to it as a podcast in the back of the van. And all of a sudden he just bursts out laughing and goes, you guys, wait till you listen to this. <laughs> and we were like oh, on our way to a World Cup. It was oh, no. so funny. <laughs> and, so, and so, of course, we all immediately download the episode and listen to it. And I admit, at first, I was kind of annoyed because I was like, man, I don't know what race she saw, but she can't possibly have seen us racing because, you know, this came in a year where, like, I finished second in the, in the World Cup overall. Um, but it was pretty funny. And I, I, had to, I had to love the idea of, you know, I was like, well, they say – that all press is good press, right? So at least they're talking about our sport. Like, this never <laughs> happens. Um, but we also were like, we have to make a video to send back to her. We were like, this is too funny. And so we were all doing strength after the races because, you know, we race Saturday, Sunday. And then Sunday, after we finished racing our brains out, we go in the gym that afternoon to lift because that's part of how oh, our wow. training works. And so we're like, you know what, we're going to do this. And so we're like, all right, we're just going to pick an exercise. So like he can buckles on 25 pounds and starts doing pull-ups. And like, I don't remember what I was doing, like some crazy setups or something. And we were all doing something. We're like, now make it look like you're texting. That's great. <laughs> but it was, it was I, really remember, I specifically remember the sit-ups with the, with the screen holding the, holding the, the, the smartphone as you went back and forth. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a very funny video. I need to, I need to ask, though, uh, let, flash forward to the Olympics then. How long after you crossed that finish line and collapsed and got all the hugs and the medal ceremony. How long did it take before somebody mentioned Poundstone? Oh my God. Um, Not too long. About a week later, we were, (laughs) one of our media agents said, Hey, you know, I've got wait, wait, don't tell me on the line. They want you to come on and specifically on a day when Paula's there. And I was like, oh, do I ever? Like, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a chance to say, go fuck yourself, Paula. But, but on but NPR. Politely, and in a but- positive, sunny, athletic way. Uh, no, I thought it was cool that you became our biggest fan. I really loved it. Oh, well, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to have been proven entirely wrong. Um, so what is your training program? I know you don't usually use the smartphones. So was what I was looking at, was that kind of what you regularly do? Oh, gosh, we do a little bit of everything. So we obviously ski a lot. But in the summer when we can't ski, we're on roller skis, which are kind of like speedy death traps because they don't have brakes. There's one wheel at the front, one wheel at the back, and you have your poles with carbide tips that stick in the asphalt. So it basically mimics all the motions of cross-country skiing, but on the road. Um, So it's a great way of training. It's total full-body workout. It's it's quite challenging, but also super fun because you're moving fast. Um, We do a lot of running. Faster than when you would on the snow, right? Uh, In some, uh, it depends on the snow, (laughs) but in some cases, yes. Um, which is really fun. Like I've gotten up to 52 miles an hour on a downhill on roller. Oh Jesus, have you fallen wow. at 52 miles an hour? Oh no, I wouldn't be here today if I had. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, all right. So when you can't winter ski, you do these roller ski things. And how many members of the team do you lose each summer as a result of that? <laughs> <laughs> we've we've lost the ability um, to have a knee modeling career or an elbow modeling career, um, but other than that, we've lost nobody. So it's um, it's good. We also do a lot of running. We do weightlifting twice a week. We do um, spinning or biking. You can swim, like basically anything that um, you would consider like uh, cardiovascularly challenging works as training for a sport. So in that way, we're really what? fortunate because it's never boring. Why weightlifting? Uh, that when you say that sometimes in cross country skiing, people are in front of you, do you have to lift them and throw them out of your way while you're skiing? Because otherwise, what on earth does weightlifting have to do with cross country skiing? Um, that's a great tactic, Paula. I should try that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's mostly to do with like um, muscular endurance and power. 
because like, so that clip you saw with the last little bit of the race, you need to mm-hmm. have the muscles in order to put on that burst of speed and to carry that power because you're trans, you're putting power from your muscles through your poles down into the snow. Um, and so if you can hit the weight room and learn how to like, um, jump higher, shift massive loads of weight faster than you're going to be, you know, snappier and poppier when you ski, which is always an advantage, especially in sprinting. And what what about, is there a dietary element to the training or, or because you work out so much, can you just eat happily? Yeah, I would say the latter. And it's kind of funny because we get so many people asking, like, are you allowed to eat dessert? Can you eat that? Which is, you know, annoying for anyone in <laughs> well, any they, they shouldn't ask it like that anyway, should they? That sounds like a terrible voice to use yeah, on you. <laughs> um, but I think one of the important things is, is really not seeing food as something that you have to earn, um, but seeing it as a, as a way to fuel for really awesome training and really awesome adventures. Um, so yeah, if we go do a four hour run in the mountains, you've got to eat a lot to, to come up with that kind of energy. Um, but yeah, one thing people should know about me is like, I love dark chocolate and I have dessert pretty much every single day. Um, because I'm, I'm a human. I'm not like some sort of crazy robot. (laughs) <laughs> wow now do you examine some of those issues in your book i understand you wrote a book yeah thank you um it came out this spring uh it's super raw and honest and it talks about the ups and the downs and that's i mean yes the olympic race that was so exciting that we won but also the races that i didn't win um and the really tough times because life isn't just one big sparkly ice cream cone um and it also talks about um the eating disorder that i had when i was 18 19 years old and how i ended up um getting help from the emily program treatment center and i'm an ambassador for them now because i feel like it's um i have this amazing opportunity to try to make the sport a healthier place and to kind of pay it forward and um, raise awareness for, you know, mental health in sports because it's super important for us to take care of ourselves um, and to look out for one another. So that's um, a couple of chapters of the book as well. So it's, it's really the full raw picture. Um, and it was, it was really fun to work on. It was exhausting, um, but it's exciting <laughs> to have it out in the world. Oh, oh it sure great. is. The, the book is called Brave Enough by Jesse Diggins, and it was published this spring, as you said. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't get to go on a book tour, did you? That's the downside of the COVIDs. No, and that would have been really fun because um, I had a co-author helping me write it. His name is Todd Smith, and he was amazing. And it would have been such a fun, like, closure, you know? Like, yes, we did it. It would have been, it would have been crossing the finish line. It'd be like racing a uh-huh. marathon, uh-huh. and then right before the finish mm-hmm. line, they're like, yeah, no. You don't get to do this. Like, you don't get across that line. So um, that part was. But a you know bummer, what? But... There's another. Keep in mind that again, this kind of book at this time is going to be helpful to um, those who read it. And so there's that finish line to cross. Absolutely. And you know, you don't get to hang a gold medal uh, for it. But I can guarantee you, there's someone who's going to really be helped. Um, but you're telling that story in this book. Um, I'm oh, going to get it. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, wow. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> Jesse, let's talk about the next book. Oh, uh, what what next book? No. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm talking about the story that's yet to be written, which is the future of the U.S. cross-country ski team. What are the prospects for uh, Beijing? So it's it's hard to tell this far out what our realistic prospects are, but... Um, in the last Olympics, I raced all six races, and my worst result was seventh in the world. Um, so I'm oh wow, yeah, definitely gunning for medals again this next time wow. around. Oh, it's going to be so much fun to know somebody who's in the Olympics that all the nobodies can cheer for. This is going to be fantastic. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> How about the men's team? You have this over them now, right? Oh yeah, but they're coming up strong. I mean, and. <laughs> I love the idea of saying, hey, guess what? Nobody's cheering for me. (laughs) That just hit me as funny. (laughs) I can tell the men's team, nobody's cheering for me. I got a leg up. Yeah, it is a leg up. (laughs) We have great fans. 
Um, so yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna have your back the whole time, and those men will just have to get their own. Um, they need a medal. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're gonna get one. We have some we have some amazing um, talent, and they're all working so hard. But it's so cool to see this generation that's coming up. Um, I'm so impressed. They're all really bought into the team. They're supportive of one another, which I think is a huge indicator of success because you're going to need that team environment. You know, nobody succeeds uh, in a vacuum by themselves. And um, it's just so cool to see all these young men and women that are, you know, investing now and doing the work that will pay off years from now at the Olympics because it's such a long-term game, which is the crazy thing in, in cross-country skiing. You have to you have to start training hard early on, but if you do, I mean, man, there's there's nothing they can't do. Well, thanks to Jesse Diggins, we've learned a lot about what it takes to win a gold medal in cross-country skiing, and now we're going to take that information, put on our cross-country skis to run it through the old Pounstonator. Paula? Travis, if I can get a little background music, I- I- I'll tell you what I discovered from Jesse Diggins. <laughs> terrific. Cross-country skiers are regular people who use will, grit, and competition to push their bodies to do more and more. They enjoy and require the support of their teammates to be successful because in cross-country, as in any sport or perhaps any worthwhile endeavor, you win and you lose. I'm going to watch that video of them grabbing the gold to inspire myself while me and the rest of us get through this difficult, lonely time. I'll listen to Chad Salmella and Steve Schlanger call the finish. So close for the U.S. Moving up on the inside, they're all completely gassed. Sweden, the U.S., and Norway. Here comes Diggins. Here comes Jesse Diggins to the line. Yes, yes, yes. And it's Jesse Diggins delivering a landmark moment that will be etched in Olympic history. I'm going to pretend they're yelling for all of us. The U.S. has lowered its COVID death rate, and not just as a percentage of the cases. They're staying inside. They're all completely masked. It's New Zealand, Taiwan, and the U.S. Here comes California, Texas, Mississippi, Nevada, Arizona. It's the United States delivering a landmark effort that will kick the shit out of the virus and make way for creating a just and equitable world. (laughs) Woo! (laughs) Woo! Fantastic. She is the gold medal winner and author of the book Brave Enough. Thank you so much for joining us, Jesse Diggins. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, Jesse. <laughs> and good luck. Oh, thank you. I'm going to need it. <laughs> Coming up, where in the world is Thomas Coyne not? Tony Nita Hall is here to update non sightings from nobodies. That's coming up right after this. They're all completely masked. This episode is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Now, you know, Adam, Mm. I am a breakfast eater. It's partly how I get myself to go to bed at night. I say to myself, I can eat in the morning. Wow. And just looking forward to that. It's it's how I get myself up as well. It's time to eat again. Um, The thing about Magic Spoon is there's so many things that aren't in there. Tell them, Adam. Well, it's got zero sugar, it's 11 grams of protein, only three net grams of carbs in each serving, four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. What's in that with all that nothing in there? There's nothing in the box. I opened the blueberry box. Nothing in there. I don't know how they're getting away with this. It, It tastes amazing. Honestly, it's too good to be true. Yeah, honestly, you, you know what, Paula? Uh, I opened one of the boxes, the fruit-flavored one, and it, it looks like a certain beloved hoop-shaped fruit cereal that you might remember from Kellogg's, except it doesn't have the sugar, and it doesn't have the soy, it doesn't have the carbs, or the gluten, or the grains, but that first bite... And the toucan tasted, is nowhere to be found. And there's no toucan, but that first bite tastes exactly like the toucan cereal. It's amazing. Wow. Boy. Uh, you know, I have the blueberry, and I have the the fruity flavor, 
Um, but I went with the uh, cocoa, and um, it's chocolatey goodness. Uh, so go to magicspoon.com slash Paula to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code Paula at checkout to get free shipping. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. No grilling. No no FBI intervention. That. That's magicspoon.com slash Paula. And use the code Paula for free shipping. We thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring our podcast. Hello? It is I, French President Trump, taking a few moments out of my visit, my former administration day, to tell you that I have a weekly mini podcast, the French Trump Weekly Presidential Press Conference. It drops Fridays at 2 p.m. Pacific time and 5 p.m. East Coast time. You simply must listen. Well, I'm off to another prison. Fun fact, the last letter to be added to the English language was not Z, but in fact the letter J. The other letters applying at the same time that failed to make the alphabet were the letters Ump, Cray, and Schwe. And we're back. And Paula, I gotta tell you, um, since the tragic death of our intern Doug, um, a whole lot of nobodies out there have been wondering uh, out loud on Facebook and on Twitter and whatnot if there's a connection to Thomas Coyne. Thomas Coyne, of course, is a survivalist who never showed up to be our guest on episode three or four of the podcast, and uh, nobody's have been keeping us posted where he's not. Uh, you know what? I never even thought of Thomas Coyne being involved in this crime, but that's that's a that's a that's a possibility. Uh, and by the way, this intensifies, this gives us more and more, uh, you know, motivation for our worldwide dragnet trying to find Thomas Coyne. I, I want to thank the nobodies once again for being so vigilant uh, in finding out where Thomas Coyne isn't. And I really think we're narrowing it down. What is this? Is this like the second year we've been looking for him? Yeah, we're on year two. We're we're well into year two of the search for Thomas Coyne, and we're getting no closer to the truth. I mean, I we lost him in episode um, four, and this is episode one hundred and eleven. Uh, and but but what I wanted to say is, there's no real reason to connect him to the death of our intern Doug, which happened just a few weeks ago. And uh, I don't know why Thomas Coyne would be involved. Well, it appears that he may have reared his head in this deep mystery, uh, possibly. Uh, wasn't Tony going to tell us about where listeners said he wasn't? Uh, yeah, our listeners have sent us a bunch of updates on Thomas Coyne, and they haven't seen him. So, Tony Anita Hull, uh, share where he isn't. Awesome. So, uh, this is from Joan Ducor. I haven't left my house in a bit, but I can assure you Thomas Coyne is not here. Joan. Joan, look under, look under the bed. That's always... The last place people look. And you have to really get a flashlight and look under there. I mean, because a lot of times criminals will slide over. Or I, I, Thomas Coyne is not a criminal, but fugitives. I was going to say, he's not a fugitive either, really. He's just a guy who didn't show up on our podcast. No, he's a fugitive. That makes him a fugitive. No, I think what makes one a fugitive is if, if one is on the run from the law. And Paula, we're, we speak authoritatively, but we are not the law. No, he's he's a fugitive. He's on the run from nobody listens to Paula Poundstone. All right, so Joan, make sure you look on both sides under the bed. Don't let him do the old, I'm close to the wall and you don't see me thing. All right, Tony, where else isn't he? 
This is from uh, Jonathan. I also wanted to let you know I had been searching for Thomas Coyne. I didn't find him in Death Valley in January, Las Vegas in the Four Queens Hotel and Casino. He wasn't on the cruise I took to the Bahamas in January. I didn't find him in Miami or anywhere in Logan Airport in Boston. That's from Jonathan Babin. Okay, now Jonathan makes some important points. All right, Jonathan, back up. <laughs> You took a cruise in January? <laughs> well, that was before COVID times, Paula. If you remember, the virus didn't didn't reach us until late February. I took one in February. <laughs> you Oh yeah. Yeah, that's right. And then were you quarantined with Jonathan afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> I um, didn't Trump did Trump know in January? He did, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, Jonathan also apparently looked through Logan Airport in Boston, and and that that mm-hmm. takes a lot of looking. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Mm-hmm. I would say um, now I think there's five Dunkin' Donuts in Logan Airport, so I'm hoping you looked in all of them, and you didn't just do like a a corporate search where you looked at one and assumed the others were uh, Thomas Coin clean. Yeah, uh, and I say look point. behind the donut holes. That's a behind the donut holes. Behind the donut holes, where they put the donut holes. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> I mean, I think one thing that Jonathan has done that a lot of our listeners haven't is he has identified a time frame in which he's looked for Thomas Coyne in these various places. Because if Thomas Coyne wasn't in Death Valley in January, that's good to know. But it doesn't mean he's not in Death Valley in February. That's ridiculous. What, uh, what do you mean? I, by the way, am part of the coronavirus task force. Um, I, 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 that's just ridiculous. <laughs> Why? You look once and you're fine. So we know he's not in Logan Airport. Um, unless he's in the parking lot. He could be in the parking lot. Look in the parking he lot. He could be in the parking lot. Yeah. Jonathan. Jonathan, look in the parking lot. Jonathan Baboon. <laughs> um, what, what else you got for us, Tony? Uh, Paula, Adam, Bonnie, Tony, Pod Puppy, everybody. I'm excited to tell you that Thomas Coyne is not on the water taxi between Locust Point and Fells Point in Baltimore this morning. But also, I was wondering, why don't you get Cher Eva to tell you all the places he is not? Susan Brannigan. That is fucking brilliant, Susan. Is it? Uh, Is it? It is. Uh, it, It is. Adam, answer the phone. Oh, no. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Answer the phone. Uh, Really? Hello? Adam? Yes? I knew it. I knew it. I knew this. It's Cher Eva. It it is. Maybe you have the gift. It's Cher (laughs) Eva. I don't have the gift. Uh, I knew it. (laughs) I knew it. Uh, Adam... Uh, Susan asked me to give you a call. Susan Brannigan. Uh, I'm... Adam, are you a little annoyed right now? Yes. Yes, I am, Shariva. I knew it. I knew it. I'm getting Can you tell me why I'm annoyed? Uh, it's just your way of being in the world. No, no, no. I'm a... (laughs) I'm a cheery, cheery person, Shariva. Most of the time, people accuse me of being too happy and happy-go-lucky. No, no. You know, I've been getting a vibe from your dog, Luna, and she feels uh-huh. that you're very negative, Adam. And so um, yeah. that's just something you might want to be aware of. That's all. Um, <laughs> I'll take it under advisement. Thank you, Cher. Adam, is Thomas Coyne in your kitchen? I don't know. He's not. He's not. I just checked in. He's not. Uh Uh-huh. I'm feeling the annoyance again. Am I right about that? Yeah. 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 Actual annoyance. I knew it. I knew it. It's no wonder Luna's been scratching a lot lately and sneezing. That's stress, Adam. That's, That's Luna's stress. She hasn't been scratching nor sneezing. I knew it. I knew it. (laughs) Am I the hundredth caller? No, you're caller number 87. 
I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> uh, I'll call back. <laughs> you don't have to. All right, share Eva, everybody. Adam? Yeah? If Thomas Coyne is in my house anywhere right now, he's four feet right. away from a spider. Absolutely true. A fact that we learned a couple of weeks ago from our spider expert, Dr. Eleanor. Um, but that would be true of any house, apparently. All right, Tony. Any more uh, Thomas Coyne non-sightings? We'll do one more. So this uh, was a, from about a week ago, because I know Adam likes his time frames. Uh, mm -hmm. You guys, I recently uh, was at Epcot, and I can attest for a fact that Thomas is not in any of these countries. Canada, United Kingdom, France, Morocco, United States, Italy, Germany, China, Norway, Mexico. This should save us months worth of expensive and completely unnecessary international travel. You're welcome, David in Orlando. David was at Epcot a week ago? Yes. <laughs> Which isn't that now the epicenter? Why would anybody be at Epcot a week ago? David? Well, he was there, I, I guess, doing reconnaissance. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I think David and Jonathan are going on a cruise together this January. Tony, you're going to be on that one, aren't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'll, be, I'll probably be there, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know what David was there at Epcot getting? What? A ventilator with Mickey Mouse on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go into those stores at Disneyland, it's just amazing the stuff they think to put, a, a, you know, some sort of Disney emblem on. But this, this Mickey Mouse ventilator thing is really taking off. It's a great idea. Yeah, plus that, that 3D movie, The Amazing World of Respiratory Distress. <laughs> oh, pe people love that. They do. People love you see it looks like that lung is coming right at you and it expands and fails to expand fully. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. And uh and then that little comedy short Goofy wears a mask. I love that. I love that cuz oh, he doesn't yeah. know how to do it, you know. He puts no, it over his goofy. ear, over his hat, over his big nose. I love Goofy, by the way. <laughs> he's, he's not good at mask wearing though. Adam, answer the phone. Answer the phone. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hello, Adam. Yes, speaking. I, it's me, Penelope Vanderbottom, the Paula Poundstone's forensic art appraiser. Yes, hello, Penelope. <laughs> I have made the most amazing discovery in Paula Poundstone's house. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Adam, you're familiar, are you not, with the painting by Renoir done in 1876, Girl with a Watering Can? Yes, I am. <laughs> oh, of course you are. Well, back behind Paula's videotapes, and they've been there for a very long time, she has Perry Mason's. And behind them, I discovered another lesser-known Renoir painting. <laughs> it's watering can with a girl. Uh, in this, Renoir featured prominently the watering can, whereas the girl, you could just see her little black shoes and a bit of her blue dress. <laughs> and Renoir was counseled at the time to change the focus to the girl and have the watering can be more incidental. And so he did that. But you know, Renoir loved gardening tools. I did not know that. Oh, he did. He did. Many art scholars say the biggest tragedies of the art world were Van Gogh cutting off his ear, the theft at the Gardner Museum in Boston, and the fact that Renoir didn't live in the time of the weed whacker. Renoir would have painted the dickens out of the weed whacker. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, wonderful. I, but, you know, I have... Uh, I've seen a lot of Renoirs, um, and I can't think of any one besides Girl with a Watering Can that has garden implements. 
Well, if you look very carefully at him, which I'm sure you haven't. <laughs> but this is what I'm paid to do, Adam. If you look very carefully at Girl with a Hoop. Um, there is a hose back behind the floral arrangements. Girl with a hoop. Yeah, it's Girl with a hoop, Adam. Yes, it's a very famous Renoir painting done with the same girl, by the way, as a girl with a watering can. It's a very famous painting. I'm surprised. Oh you no, don't I'm from fami- I'm familiar with it, but I don't see it. There's no gardening implements in that. Um, I mean, I don't want to contradict you, but I just I've just never seen a gardening in- implement in in Girl with a hoop. That's a, you it's know, a, can I it's make a little a girl in a blue Adam? dress. Can I just make a suggestion? If you don't want to contradict me, then don't. (laughs) 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 That's the best solution there, I think. That works for me, I think. Yeah. I mean, is this what you're trained to do, Adam? Um, yeah, you know, on, on this show, I tend You're to be sort of a... You're a trained forensic art appraiser because I don't remember seeing no. you in class. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not any kind of art appraiser. Not at all. Oh, well, my, I rest my case. Uh, uh, you know, perhaps... I, have you ever seen Renoir's girl with a case? No, I have not. <laughs> it's very famous, a very famous girl with a case. Now, there was another... Is it a case of gardening tools? uh, It was not a case of gardening tools, Mr. Snooky Pants. (laughs) (laughs) Snooky Pants? Okay. Well, Adam, I'm going to have to go. I was just telling you of this very exciting find I made behind the Perry Mason videos at Paula Poundstone House. She is going to be dripping in cash. I mean, you may now think of her as an unemployed comic, but that's not where the story ends, Adam. <laughs> no, I actually think of her more as an oversexed elderly turtle. But, you know, it's, it's anybody's guess where the Poundstone story is going to go from here. She is an oversex turtle. <laughs> Wait, what? Okay, All right, um... I have to go, Adam. All right, well, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Absolutely. It was so nice talking to you, Mr. Snooky Pants. <laughs> Please don't call me Snooky Pants ever again. Wow, Paula. So uh, at least one person thinks that you have a gold mine in your house. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Every time Penelope Vanderbottom comes to my house, I, ka-ching, ka-ching. I'm not worried about uh, money and, and anymore. And may I say, you seem to have an inordinately large number of people just stopping by your house during these COVID times. Well, she had a mask on and we stayed six feet apart. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you. Oh, you, you, hey, you, Mrs. Poundstone, Mrs. Poundstone. I, oh, I hope you minute. don't mind me popping my head in. Detective, uh... Yeah, it's me, Detective Delano from the L.A. Police Department. Uh, oh, how are you, Miss Poundstone? People do, just, people do just keep popping in. Hello, Detective Delano. Well, your door was open, so I thought I'd just kind of come in and say hi. No reason, really. I, you know, I was in the neighborhood, and uh, uh, some art dealer just pulled away from your house. I love art, Mrs. Poundstone. That was Penelope Vanderbottom. Oh, okay, great. Well, she's a, a, a forensic art appraiser. Well, isn't that interesting? You know, my wife, she loves art. Anyway, I guess I better go. W- well, was there anything you wanted? No, no, no. I, I'm obviously I'm still investigating the tragic murder of your your beloved intern Doug. Uh, but there's no reason. I, you know, I'm I'm gonna go. I better go. I'm leaving. But. Uh-oh. Okay, Mrs. Poundstone, good. Mrs. Poundstone, yeah. one more thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this uh, manager you have, you have a manager, don't you, Mrs. Poundstone? I do, a wonderful manager, Bonnie Burns, a.k.a. Captain Crinkle. Oh, that's so nice, that's so nice. You know, there's nothing like a good manager. They just take care of stuff for you. Wouldn't you say, Mrs. Poundstone, they take care of stuff for you? She does a lot of stuff for me. She's fantastic. I mean, I would say she's the, she's the best there is. 
Okay, I, I'm sure she is. So if you had a problem, she doesn't that always hear what you say. You have to repeat yourself a lot. But other than that, and it's not just hearing. A lot of times, she's just plain not listening. I hear that. You know, my wife deaf as a post in her left ear. But that's not neither here nor there. Yeah, yeah. What I really wanted to ask Miss Pounce on is if you, you do have a manager, right? And and she takes care of things for you. So if anything in your life was a problem or anyone in your life was a problem, she'd kind of take care of it, wouldn't she? Oh, she's not like a fixer. She's not Michael Cohen. Oh, no, of course not. But, like, if there was somebody annoying you or, or on the he- on the, onto a secret that you didn't want revealed, that person might uh, get taken care of by your manager, wouldn't she? Or he? You know, if you're trying to suggest that my manager killed Doug... Uh, understand this. We call her Captain Crinkle for a reason. She couldn't have snuck up on him. <laughs> well, that's it then. You know, when you're right, you're right. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I really shouldn't have even dropped by anyway. And I'm going to show myself out. But Ms. Poundstone, one more thing. Yeah. You you know, you, you're close with that Bonnie Burns, right? You talk to her all the time, obviously. I do. Could, could, I don't suppose you know where she was the night of the murder. I, I absolutely know. She has this kind of fancy porch furniture. Okay. Yeah. She, I can tell you this. She wasn't vertical. She hasn't been vertical in the last year. Oh, she's been horizontal. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that. You know, it's very hard to commit a murder if you're if you're horizontal. Although it has happened. Yeah, Detective Delano, what town was Doug in? Oh, he was in Studio City, I think. Okay, then she was nowhere near. <laughs> okay, well, of, of course not. Of course not. You know, it was silly, s- silly hunch that I had. Not nothing important, Miss Bounstone. I'm sorry to bother you. Please continue to have a a lovely plague, Mrs. Bounstone. All right. Uh, thank you so much. You too. Enjoy the plague. Wow, Paula, that was uh, that was interesting. Boy, he's really sniffing around Bonnie, aka uh, Captain Crinkle, as a suspect. Yeah, I'm telling you, she couldn't. You know, she's not a hunter. Uh, she couldn't s- sneak up on anything. The <laughs> all right, well, I guess not, Bonnie. Uh, bon- Bonnie, what about this and Detective Delano and what he was saying? You must have been listening. Was non plus mean baffled or? I think nonplussed means confused, I think, yeah. No yeah. confused. Um, well, which would be like baffled. I'm stumped. I think the Studio City thing is, you know, maybe the way Tony seems so, like, you know, she's so nice and everything. Maybe Tony, Doug said, I don't know, it can't Bonnie, be Bonnie, are you trying to throw suspicion onto Tony Anita Hall? <laughs> no, you know what? <laughs> Externally, Tony seems You can seems clear your own nice. name without doing that. No, I, I think I think Bonnie's onto something. I, Tony's very, very sweet externally, but inside, she's an inferno. Well, we did hear her say fuck once. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love Tony. I don't know. I'm. I guess I'm not. I guess I'm not blessed, and I hope I have the right meaning. Here's the thing. How do you know Doug wasn't killed? Like. He had some side life, and there wasn't some guy he was involved with. Like, you know, we have him sign a non-disclosure agreement. How do you know, like, he wasn't going to sell some story about us? Oh, the, that's a good point. Like uh, one of those rag magazines. Yeah, he could have been going to the Inquirer. <laughs> yeah, or all Fox the Im- News. Well, all the information <laughs> about this could be in that safe that they always talk about at the Inquirer. Yeah, I think Paula's right. I haven't gotten off my ass in months. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even looked into Doug's life. You know, yeah, that's, you know, that's absolutely right. Instead we of, didn't know a lot. There's a reason we didn't know a lot about him. Yeah, instead mm. of just pointing the finger at all of us, I think we need to find out a little bit more about Doug. Yeah, I think we, us and our listeners should possibly look into what Doug was up to when he wasn't interning for us. Yeah, he just came up with that name, Burns. <laughs> now you don't even think it's his real last name? Bonnie, you're, you're trying no, to throw so much mud in the water here. he was selling himself as somebody he wasn't. I think he was, he was, 
He was trying desperately to get the gig as um, postmaster general. Yeah. <laughs> we would have been better off. <laughs> yeah, we would have well, been better off. It's obviously too late for him now. Poor Doug. And, you know, Paula, it's a shame he died before he had a chance to experience your new game show. Well, it is kind of uplifting. I'm launching a new game show called Nobody Asked You, starring Paula Poundstone. Each week, two contestants earn points for what they know about each other. It's a Zoom show, and although I apologize for that, I didn't start the pandemic. It came from China. You can find it on YouTube and our social networks like Facebook. It starts this Thursday, and there will be a new episode each week. China. Uh, Paula, what other Poundstone products can pick up a listener's spirits? All of them. <laughs> if you go to the store, you can find the Poundstone Pussy Pillows, which are four and a half by five inch pillows full of catnip. And on one side, there's a printed cat joke. And on the other side, I'm happy to autograph it to your cat. On the form, when you order it online, uh, there's a space for you to put in your cat's name. Put it there, and I'm on it. It's at paulapoundstone.com. Also, if you wanted to communicate with a friend through me, uh, I am doing cameo videos for, you know, birthdays and anniversaries and just to say hello or lift someone's spirits. You can go to www.cameo.com slash paulap33 to request a message from me, and I'm happy to deliver it. That's fantastic. And... Uh, speaking of comedy, if you love baseball but wishes it was a little funnier, this Sunday and every Sunday, it's the Starburn Sports Sunday simulcast with Jeff Cesario and Paula. It's me, Adam Felber. Uh, here's how it works. You turn on uh, Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN, turn the sound down, and use your phone or laptop to turn up me and Jeff calling the game along with a menagerie of special guest comedians. You can get our feed by finding the Starburn's audio channel on youtube or just grab the link from my twitter feed which is at adam felber that's the starburn sports sunday simulcast game time is 7 p.m eastern 4 p.m pacific this sunday that sounds like fun it's lots of fun now as we said we want to hear from all you nobodies out there once again if you want to send us a song a succinct show description or just drop us a line it's nobody listens to paula poundstone at gmail.com nobody listens to paula poundstone at gmail.com you can find me and Adam on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We're all over the place. And check out our Facebook page at Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. That's our show. Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone is hosted by Paula Poundstone and yours truly, Adam the Felber. Special thanks to our guest, Jesse Diggins. And thanks to our house band, Nobody, Travis Vance. Our show is produced by Paula Poundstone, Adam Felber, Bonnie Burns, Ken Lezebnik, and Tony Anita Hull. Mixing by Michael Hoagie. Starburns production by Land Romo. Thanks to our former intern, Doug, who... Is gone, and apparently we don't know enough about him yet. Transcription <laughs> services for the show provided by Transcribe Me, a premier internationally used transcription service. Use code Paula Poundstone when placing your order at transcribeme.com to receive an expedited service. That's our show for tonight. Won't somebody please listen to me? You know, I feel terrible now that I, I didn't learn enough about Doug. You know, it could help solve the crime, and, and, and maybe I, I don't know, maybe I just sort of engaged him more as, a, as an intern, made his experience with us more rich. I feel like I should have too, but I, I gotta tell you, I didn't engage with him a lot because of that thing on his face. <laughs> I couldn't not look at the thing on his face, you know? Yeah, 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 you gotta get, you gotta get beyond that. Um, it was big. Yeah, but I mean that's that's not the important part of Doug. The, the, the important... No, but it's really noticeable when. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was he? But I mean, what was that, the important so, part? So that's why you didn't say where you're from. I yeah, I probably should have said where you're from, but like, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to look at him. It was a disturbing. Uh, I don't even know what you would call it. It was either a birthmark like or a. a pet. It was like a, a, a birthmark, and it was it was kind of shaped like Africa. So were you afraid that you would say to him, where are you from, Africa? Yeah. And that then he would know that you were looking at that? Yeah. Yeah. And okay. he'd know I was staring at his birthmark, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can see where that would have been awkward. 
Yeah. I just feel terrible. Like, it's weird that the guy's gone now, and all of a sudden I realize, I know nothing about him. And we worked together for I don't even know how long. <laughs> I don't even know how long either. It was just death. Yeah. <laughs> In some ways, it was almost like I was hearing about him for the first time when he died. Well, me too. And I thought, am I that shallow? Am I that uh, cold that here we had an intern, you know, working his heart out, and I never even thought to say, do you work here? I never even thought to say that. Yeah, well, it's that thing on his face. You're worried that you might say, do you work here or Africa? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. Stop. That's... Yeah, and that's not like me. That's not like me. But sometimes, you know, you make a, a, a faux pas, a, a, a solecism. Star Avenue, a podcast, <clears throat> a podcast network.